Timothy Biazzi, welcome to Developmental Disabilities Journal. I have with me today Janet Koch, Amanda Graves, and Robert Budd. Today's topic is Developmental Disabilities, Crisis to Opportunity. I'd like to explain a little bit about what a developmental disability is. Uh, it could be anything that occurs between, the age, between birth and the age of 21. And it could be a fall, birth asphyxia, it could be Down syndrome, blindness, deafness, cerebral palsy, uh, any, anything that impairs a person and will impair that person for life. Of course, if it occurs after 21, it's usually a, a traumatic brain injury, which we call a TBI, uh, which also will impair that person for the rest of their life, but that comes under a whole different category. And now I'd like my panel to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Janet Koch, the CEO of Life's Work. Life's Work is an organization that was established 50 years ago to provide advocacy and supports and services to people with developmental disabilities. I myself have been in this field for more than 30 years doing great work for great people. It's a pleasure to be here with you. My name is Amanda Graves. I'm a direct support manager at Life's Work. Um, I've been with the agency for about five years. I've been in the fields for about 12. Um, I enjoy what I do and continue to provide support to the people that live in the residences. It's a pleasure to be here with my colleagues. And John, thanks for the opportunity. As Janet said, we love to spread the word of who we are honored to support every day. Family Residences and Essential Enterprises, otherwise known as FREE, has been around for over 40 years. I've been there for over 36 of those years. And we are proud to serve people with intellectual developmental disabilities, traumatic brain injury, mental illness, and co-occurring disorders. When folks come into this field, they either leave before lunch on the first day or they get sucked in and they're locked in for a long, long time. Uh, I know that I fell in love with, with the folks that we support uh, almost immediately. Um, let's talk about a little bit about the history of the field and how, how it developed mm -hmm. out of Willowbrook and, uh, and those horrible things that happened in the 70s. So actually, our founder, Vicki Schnepps, her daughter was <clears throat> placed in Willowbrook um, many years ago, and she had started to notice some of the atrocities that were existing there. And as many people are aware, Geraldo Rivera had his expose, which helped to uncover those so that mainstream you know, public found out, and that's what helped to close down institutions. The reason the care in those institutions was so bad and so poor at that time was mainly to do with funding. Mm -hmm. Something that's familiar to us again. And the governor at the time, I believe, was Rockefeller, and there was many, many budget cuts, which led to reduced staff. So there was, at times, nurses, one nurse for 50 people, which obviously did not provide the best care. And then after that, group homes began. There was lawsuits, class action lawsuits and all, um, that helped to change the field for the better. Mm -hmm. Willowbrook didn't start out to be a hellhole. Willowbrook started out to be a good, good place for folks with disabilities. It was really, as you said, the funding that, that just went down and... Uh, mm -hmm. It was actually considered state-of-the-art at the time. Yeah. It was formed with a wonderful belief system that people have abilities and that when given the opportunity to thrive within uh, the proper support, that they could be meaning meaningfully contributing to their local community. Unfortunately, what then occurred is instead of the linkage to the community being maintained, the, they became very insular. There was an isolation uh, that occurred, and there were little enclaves where people rarely had contact with the community. And part of that, as Janet already highlighted, was due to funding cuts, which prevented there being enough staff mm -hmm. to create that linkage. And then there was a change in philosophy. So there was a wonderful intention for having people connected to community. And then we lost sight of the reason that those places were created. Not so dissimilar from the challenge that we are currently experiencing, where people start to take for granted that people are out in the community. Um, but that's not to be taken for granted lightly, because no. once again, because of staffing challenges, mm -hmm. because of funding cuts and with a lack of investment in our field, we were very frightened that we might be experiencing the community version of Willowbrook. 
And we never want that to ever happen again. We, we never want uh, our folks to ever be subjected to those kind of things again. Uh, you, you mentioned economics. And uh, I say it the old way because that's the way my economics professor said it at St. John's many years ago. Uh, but our field does have a social and economic impact mm -hmm. on the community and in a variety of ways. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, for example, um, I manage a home with um, seven residents, and um, we're located in Massapequa. And one of the favorite things of the people there to do is to go to the mall. And I tell you, when they go to the mall, it's not like me going to the mall. When mm -hmm. I go, beeline where I'm going, and I'm out. But when they go, the, the contribution that they make is extensive. They walk through the mall, it's Auntie Annie's first, then a haircut, then the nail salon, then I want to buy clothes, and I want to see a movie. <laughs> um, so really and truly, them not being able to access their community due to lack of staffing really has an impact for the entire neighborhood, mm -hmm. which then mm -hmm. you know travels onward and upward towards county, state. Mm -hmm. um, and it's because we don't have the staffing in order to be able to allow them access. And the staffing issue is a couple of different things, right? Uh, we, we funding and, uh, and also the long working hours. We can't maintain the staff. And you guys want to talk about that? Um, so, you know, long before the pandemic, we were experiencing um, significant funding cuts, which led to less and less people wanting to come in the field. John, you mentioned earlier how most of us have been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, we started in the field, most of us out of college, and we never left because of brown hair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, now to have new people come into the field, we're fortunate with someone like Amanda, who's been around for five years. You don't really hear so often people 10, 15, 20 years because the compensation, it's just not competitive. It's not competitive. It's hard work. It's not minimum wage work. So, you know, now the fight is on to make it a field that's attractive. We know it's attractive to people's hearts. You know, there's not another field that you can feel as good as we do each and every day, yep. making differences in people's lives. But that deserves fair compensation. Absolutely. You know, if you look at this as a, this is not a New York specific issue or a Long Island specific mm -hmm. issue or, or an issue just specific to our organizations, it's a national staffing crisis. Mm -hmm. We anticipated it because we knew that the lines were going to cross a few years ago where there were no longer enough people available to serve the aging population. The baby boomers are now taking more uh, desirous care themselves. So mm -hmm. there is just not enough people. So nationally, Anchor the American Network for Community uh, Options and Resources has been trending this phenomena and doing many independent studies to demonstrate to our decision makers that this crisis was unfolding. Unfortunately, just as the pandemic hit, it was like the perfect storm. The, the crossing of the lines for there no longer being enough people at the same time that the pandemic hit, making the need for quality individuals soared. Yeah, we had not enough folks and more folks needed because of the, the severe needs placed on us. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that folks understand the, uh, the, the age range of people that we serve, okay? Maybe you want to talk about, you know, do we serve just old people, was, you know, we're not, we're not a nursing home. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. No, so, so, go ahead, Amanda. Go ahead, Amanda. Okay, so in the residents that I, um, I do manage, um, when I first started there, the youngest person was 23, and the eldest was, I believe, 73. And there were only seven of them. Um, so the needs for each of those people in the house, it varies, um, whether it be physical. Um, I also have people that reside there that need a lot of emotional support. And the COVID pandemic was really a pressure chamber for that, mm -hmm. where you saw or the need to have the psychological support to keep, you know, emotional balance. And um, so it's not just people on the higher end of the age <laughs> scale. Um, we, we serve people that also have a lot of youth, that they, they want to experience a lot more things and do a lot more. And then we have those that are older that their need then becomes a little bit more physical. Um, and linking all of these things back together, Janet, you had mentioned you know, people no longer stay in the field for five, mm -hmm. ten years. So now here we have people providing support, but they stay two, three weeks. And each of these people are then exposed to another person. And this is yeah. their home. Um, it, it really is a pressure. And it's, it's a very um, 
interesting thing for folks when somebody leaves, when, when a staff member leaves, when, mm -hmm. and they get used to a staff member, and uh, sometimes you have to let a staff member go, and they say, well, you know, where's Johnny? We want Johnny back, and uh, it's, it's difficult to explain. It's very difficult to explain when one of the folks living in a residence passes away. Mm-hmm. Or goes to a, has to go to a nursing home, and there's there's a void there that I've I've been used to having these same people with me, and they're not here anymore. Um, and we also serve folks who are very young, early intervention, mm -hmm. and that's a very important piece of what we do. Uh, so from three years old until mm -hmm. 103 years old, we mm -hmm. we we serve folks that. Uh, that need our services. You guys want to talk a little bit about maybe the younger people? Do you want to start? So um, we certainly, um, the educational system has evolved significantly, but there are also folks that don't do well in the traditional educational system. So and Janet can speak a, a bit more specifically to the school system. But in general, respite services, vocational training services, recreation and opportunities for clinical support groups, these are all part of the gamut of services that are provided uh, for the younger folks, and then right through the lifespan. We recently were, were very disappointed. We had a gentleman whose life expectancy was in his 50s, and he uh, just passed a couple of weeks before he turned 100. Wow. Um, so people are living much longer. Uh, people who have very complex needs are still living much longer. Mm -hmm. um, years ago, we didn't know that people with Down syndrome, for example, were prone to dementia and Alzheimer's. However, now that they're living longer, we know that early onset is very common, actually. Mm -hmm. So the complexity of the needs continues continues to rise, and therefore the skill level of the members who support those individuals is essential to make sure that we have true people who are seen and valued as essential workers and treated as the professionals that they're required to be. Robert, you mentioned the word, you said respite. Could you explain to the folks uh, a little bit more about exactly what respite is, because it, you know, it sounds like um, you're taking a nap, and it's not really what respite <laughs> is. <laughs> Maybe for us as we... Um, Maybe for me it would be a nap. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> but explain a little bit about what respite does. Either of you uh, can chime so in. So there's actually two types of respite services. There's an overnight respite, which often, you know, and this often is a support to younger families as well, where a family who has a person with a disability that lives home with them maybe needs a break and, you know, they want to go away for a weekend or something like that. There's organizations, free being one of them, that provides overnight respite opportunities. And then there's just a normal, typical, weekend recreational respite where kids can go for some fun classes, you know, and things like that, which also still, the design is to give the family a respite. Um, but, you know, our field, we support people from three years old through, as you said, 103. Um, I think most people aren't familiar, and for the audience's sake, up until 21, it's typically the school system that's responsible mm -hmm. for a person, the state education department. When a person becomes 21, then they move into the Office of People with Developmental Disabilities disabilities, and there's different services that are provided there, group homes being one of them. I think it's also important to mention each group home looks different. It could be an all-male home, an all-female home. It could be a home that people have mental illness, people have autism, people have medical needs, wheelchairs, feeding tubes, colostomy bags. The range and the gamut is really, you know, it's quite extensive. And something along with all of the funding cuts that's changed in that is we used to have a little bit more flexibility, opportunity. Families had a little bit more choice in where a person would live, hopefully for the rest of their lives in a group with people who are maybe similar to them, whether that be in their sex, their their religion, or something of that nature, and their diagnosis. Or, you know, maybe they want to be in a home where there's people who are more capable than them. Now today, you know, we're working off of lists of people who are deemed as a priority in need of care. And often, you know, that might not be what's best. As Amanda described, somebody being in their early 20s and someone being in their 70s, mm -hmm. You know, that's not a typical peer group. So the needs of those people are very, very different, even if they had the same diagnosis. A person who's in their 20s has more energy and wants to do different things mm. than perhaps a person in their 70s. Mm. 
What I, I, I'd like to, we talked a bit, little bit about the uh, community impact. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about folks with developmental disabilities going to work a little bit. Mm -hmm. Because they do go to work. Yes. And uh, I know that if you go to City Field or Yankee Stadium, I mean, you go to that hot dog stand, chances are you're being served by one of our guys. Mm -hmm. And you're getting the correct change and you're getting what you ordered. And so, but let's talk a little bit about more the, the employment opportunities. Sure. So one of the principles that drive the services that we all offer is the idea that it should be based upon the person's interests and that person's abilities and to build on the abilities and the strengths and interest of that person. And so whether it be a living circumstance, Janet mentioned uh, group homes is a very common uh, option for people. There's also uh, apartments that people might live in. There's also services that people can receive in their own home or in their family's home. The same gamut runs for vocational training opportunities, for assessments to occur, for supports to be put in place, and to build on people's interests and strengths so that they can be competitively employed in the community of their choice. And that's one of the opportunities that we all provide, is how do any of us know what we like to do? Well, often it's through trial and error. Mm -hmm. um, so the more opportunities that we are able to create to be out in the community and to be meaningfully engaged through volunteer opportunities, just visit, visiting different um, sites to, for us as organizations to create small businesses that allow people a range of training and vocational interests to be explored, this is the backbone of our business. Um, it's to really be able to say, what is it you'd like? And then our job is to figure out how do we deliver on that. That's, that's not always an easy thing. That's, that's sometimes challenging. And uh, let's talk about supported employment just a little mm -hmm. bit and what, what that means, because that's, that's an important piece of the whole employment yeah. thing. Janet? Yeah. So as Robert said, we typically go through an exploration, a discovery period, where we work with a person with a disability to try to identify what it is that they're seeking in terms of employment, what might be a good match for them. And then we provide training, different aspects of training. Um, and then eventually, you know, you also have somebody who's working on relationships with employers to see who would be amenable to supporting our folks. Um, then you find that match, and you provide a job job coach who works side by side with the person for a number of weeks or months um, and, you know, hopefully gets that person to be able to be on their own and work independently for an employer. Cool. Um, how about the challenges that, that are presented with um, a person who is aging, an individual who is aging, and living at home with parents who are aging? Mm -hmm. right? That's a challenge that we see more and more because of the limited uh, space that we have in our group homes. I, I want to talk about that. That's that's. So as you know, people age often, you know, many people will choose to have their family member live home with them. And then as the parents, you know, age, it becomes too physically demanding. And that's often when they'll come join an organization like our, either of ours and many others. Um, and then they move in. We have the skilled professionals mm -hmm. who are trained and know how to care for a person. And then, you know, on the emotional side, we become their pseudo family. People like Amanda become the family to the extended family and the person in her care. And then as those, you know, the parents may pass on, they know that their family member will be cared for long into the future and that there'll be people like Amanda and the other workers in her home who will be there for them emotionally, physically, mentally, in every way possible. Did you want to add no, to that? On, on top of that, in, in addition to being an extension of the family of the person we're supporting, I've seen recently where we now become an extension of the family as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we were talking about people that are in the homes are now aging. Um, we're talking changes in ability, walking, no longer walking, um, from independently feeding themselves to now having a peg tube. And a lot of the times, the families aren't ready for it. Yeah. Um, no matter what signs they may see or how, how prepared they may have been or how much they might have been informed. And the, the workers, these, these DSPs in the homes, they become an extension of the family, not only supporting that person, but the family themselves, they lean on them for support mm -hmm. also. Because a lot of moms and dads are saying, well, I don't want to, I'm not ready to cut the cord and I'm, I, I want to keep my kid close to me. Uh, and that's a very common thing. 
So that's, um, in those cases where that's an active choice, I think um, that is certainly understandable and you can plan uh, accordingly. The most frustrating and sometimes very sad days that we experience is when someone's unaware of services. Mm. It's one of the reasons it's so important to do shows like this because people often don't even know that services exist and they make assumptions that perhaps a family member is going to be able to step in and that's not always true. Mm -hmm. And so some of our most frustrating days is when we receive an emergency call that someone had a caregiver who is elderly, didn't plan on becoming ill or disabled or worse, mm -hmm. um, and suddenly they are now in a totally new environment or they have someone coming into their home to provide services in their home that they've never met before. And then the trauma of this major life change is exacerbated um, tenfold because of the lack of people understanding that there are supports that can be planned for so that when those traumatic life events occur, as they inevitably will, um, that the person already knows people, they're already connected, and perhaps through mm -hmm. a social program or someone coming to the house, but then they have a trusted team mm -hmm. member um, that they can depend on, which really speaks to one of the other issues that we've referenced a number of times, is that every example we're using is about people forming relationship. You know, ultimately, when we are doing an, a welcome of our new team members, we talk about we are human beings supporting other human beings. Mm -hmm. We just are talking about different abilities that we're going to be building on. And just like you or I would want someone we know and trust to be providing a support, and statistics say, that if we're fortunate enough to live our expected lifespan, we will all be the recipient of some type of support. Absolutely. So I think this is something anyone in the general community, if they think about it in those terms, can relate to how important it is to be able to have people be able to afford to stay in the field and to work with the people they absolutely form relationship with, that there's a unique bond, there's a true love that occurs when human beings are supporting other human beings. And we... We, it is so frustrating for us to see people literally say, I can't afford to stay in the field. I would love to, but I have to feed my family. Yeah, that's a, that's a very important thing. I have to feed my family. And uh, Amanda and the folks who work for her, under her supervision, are definitely not uh, minimum wage workers. They, they, they have lives in their hands. They're responsible for lives. They're responsible for the well-being of the people that they serve, uh, that su they support. Excuse me, I always say that. Uh, you know, let me, let me just roll back a couple of seconds about getting services. A few years ago, I was asked to give the graduation speech at the um, JFK Junior School in Queens. Uh, I was able to pick up a couple of ties at the Queen Center Mall before I went. Mm -hmm. um, but anyhow, I, I, I gave this speech, and there were parents were like deers in headlights that they had no idea where to turn. My kid has been in this school since he was a little kid, and now what do we do tomorrow? Mm -hmm. We're getting a diploma. What do we do tomorrow? I, let's talk a little bit about how you go about getting services, how a parent... Uh, can can try to get serve or can get services for for their their child. So many times they refer to it as falling off the cliff. Yeah. Yes. And it really is a big big difference from school age children and being in the care of a school district and all those administrators, all of those teachers, all the people you've worked with for so many years. It's also adulthood, right? It's as if your son or daughter graduates college and now what's next for them. So, you know, they come into our world, they go through a care manager, a care coordination organization, they're assigned a care manager who should be able to evaluate their care and they may already have one, which is what Robert was speaking to. The earlier you can start to receive services through OPWDD, Office of People with Developmental Disabilities, mental health, anything of the sort, is very helpful to make that transition a bit easier later on. But I think it's important to reference, overall, the system is good. 
There is a really, really good system in place in New York. New York far surpasses many of the other states in our country, and there are many services. It's not always perfect. It's not always easy. But you get through those moments. You come into the care of people like all of us um, and many, many others. It's a good system. It's worth it. And it's also why we call upon families, people in the community, neighbors to our group homes and our programs to advocate with us, mm -hmm. to be part of this discussion and this advocacy to make sure that the people doing this hard and important work are fairly compensated so people can live with dignity until they enter their life. Advocacy. That's a very important thing. And that's one of the things we're going to ask everybody who's watching this show to take part in advocacy. Uh, you don't have to be a licensed lobbyist. You don't have to go and uh, uh, be paid to be a professional lobbyist. I can say, though, that we as professionals, when we go to Albany and we say to the assemblyman or the senator, Senator, save our services, what they're hearing is save my job. Mm -hmm. When a parent or a, uh, a sibling goes to that same senator and says save our services, they're hearing a whole different message. They're hearing, save my kid. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very important for every parent and every self-advocate out there to take part in advocacy, to be part of the advoc advocacy for your, your, uh, your son, your daughter, your brother, your sister, uh, or yourself if you're a self-advocate. That's very important. And you can go to Albany, or we're going to ask you to write your state and federal uh, representatives, that's your two senators, we have your congress member, uh, your state senator, your assembly person, the governor, and the brand new commissioner uh, of, of OPWDD, uh, Kerry Neifeld, uh, to write to them and to say, you know, a lot of stuff went by the wayside yes. oh, since 2008 in particular, mm -hmm. when, when the budget pr crisis hit New York State. And we hope that uh, you'll work toward restoring those funds so that we can pay our folks a living wage so that uh, they will stay in the field and we can continue to, develop, to deliver the quality services that you've been uh, become used to. And we'll be flashing that up in a couple of seconds. Uh, but uh, again, I'd like to thank the panel this morning. And our next show, uh, we'll go in to depth in a specific area that we covered today. We tried to give you an overall look at, uh, at the field and where it's going and where it's been and how we got here. So thank you, Janet. Thank you, John. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Thank uh, you. We look forward to uh, getting together again and talking some more. Mm -hmm.